Did you know that the Virgin Mary is prefigured in the Ark of Noah? Furthermore, today I will also explain how this figure type tells us something about the message of Our Lady of Fatima and the time that we have left to heed her. You're listening to Genesis 315. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. I'm your hostess, Mariana Bartold, the author of Fatima, The Signs and Secrets, and Guadalupe, Secrets of the Image. As the scriptures tell us in Genesis 7:23, And Noah only remained, and they that were with him in the ark. And what did Our Lady say of herself at Fatima, Portugal, in 1917? She said that only she can help us. But first, let us look to the story of Noah and the Ark so that we will fully understand. As the inhabitants of the earth began to multiply and grew in number, their sins also increased, and in the process of time their corruption became so great and universal that scarcely any remains of virtue could be discovered in them. Then God, seeing the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that all the thought of their heart was bent upon evil at all times, repented that he made man. He resolved to sweep him off the face of the earth, and with him all the living creatures that had been made for his service. Among the vast multitude of men then living in the world, only one, Noah, found grace before the Lord. He was chosen to be the restorer of the human race. To him God communicated the resolution he had made of destroying the earth by a universal deluge and his intention of showing mercy to him and his family. At God's command, Noah built an ark, and it was in this ark that when the waters of the flood covered the earth, he and his wife and his sons and their wives and the animals that were with them were saved. When the waters of God's anger began to prevail and increased and gradually rose until they covered even the tops of the highest mountains, the ark was lifted up on high. And when all flesh was destroyed that moved upon the earth, and all things that lived upon the earth, from man even to beast, died, the ark did not perish, but remained safe in the midst of this general destruction. The waters of the flood sent upon earth on account of the wickedness of man represent the deluge of sin in which the whole human race was submerged and perished. From Adam's fall to the last day, which will put an end to the present state of things here below. All must say with David, as he did in Psalms 50, verse 7, Behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But in this universal catastrophe, there is one creature that does not perish. There is an ark which rises above the waters. It is Mary, the living ark of the Lord. She was, through the foreknown merits of Jesus Christ, her divine Son, preserved from original sin. God founded her upon the seas and prepared her upon the rivers. In her conception she received a blessing from the Lord and mercy from God, her Savior, as we see foreshadowed in Psalms 23, verses 3 through 5. God helped her in the morning early. The Most High sanctified his ark, his tabernacle also foreshadowed in Psalm 14, verse 1. The Ark of Noah was made at God's command, and according to the description and instructions which he gave. But of Mary, the new Ark of Noah, God is not only the architect, he moreover executed the work himself. The Blessed Virgin is, in a special manner, God's own masterpiece, and the most admirable and excellent work of his own hands. Before going any further, if you don't want to miss any new broadcasts, please be sure to like and subscribe to this channel, Genesis 315. And also, please kindly consider sharing this episode with your family and friends. To continue.
In the upper portion of the Ark of Noah there was a large window, whereas the sides were well closed and pitched within and without. In a similar manner, the Immaculate Heart of the Mother of God was closed to the world and opened to God and heavenly things. The Ark had a door, which was closed by the Lord himself, and herein we have a figure of the most pure, most admirable, and unspotted virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The first ark contained Noah, the restorer, and the second father of the human race. Mary, the second ark, contained not Noah, but more than Noah, namely Noah's creator, who is the true father and restorer of our race, giving not only to man a continuance of his temporal existence here on earth, but restoring to our immortal souls the life of grace, without which we would be irretrievably lost, and procuring eternal life for us by redeeming us with his precious blood. This world and our life here below are also represented by the deluge. The ark is a figure of the church of God. Just as all those who were outside the ark perished, so there is no salvation outside the church. What we say here of the church of God may also in a certain sense be said of our blessed lady, who is described by the unanimous consent of pious authors as an ark of salvation. As those who were in the ark were preserved from the waters of the deluge, so a true servant of Mary cannot perish. In Noah's ark, a few, that is, eight souls, were saved, as we are reminded in 1 Peter 3, verse 20. In Mary, many have found rest. Through her, many have been saved. In her, that is, in love and devotion to her, the saints have found rest, as the history of their lives testify, in her they were secure, for the Blessed Virgin obtained for them the grace to continually be faithful in the service of God, and procured them, by her intercession, the crowning blessing of final perseverance. Noah's Ark contained not only human beings, but also animals. In these animals we may see a figure type of sinners, because they lead an animal life, gratifying their passions and their evil inclinations, neglecting their immortal soul, and forgetting their eternal destiny. If the sinner desires to escape destruction, let him enter into the ark, for the animals that were not in the ark perished. Let not the pitiful state to which his evil deeds have reduced him deter the sinner from having recourse to Mary, for even the unclean animals were called to the ark and found shelter therein. Mary is the mother of mercy. For the sake of the poor sinner, she has become the mother of God, and therefore she will not send away nor despise anyone. Mary is near to all who invoke her. Holy Scripture says that the ark rested upon the mountains of Armenia, or, as we read in the Hebrew text, the mountains of Ararat, which is interpreted to mean the mountains of malediction. For just reasons the earth was cursed. The sinners have drawn upon themselves the anger and the curse of God. But in the midst of these mountains of malediction is the station of the Mother of God, and thus to the end of the world she remains for the guilty children of Adam an ark of blessing and salvation. In the works of St. Bernard, in his sermons on the Blessed Maria, we find the following description of the ark considered as a figure of our Blessed Lady. Quote, the ark of Noah represented the ark of grace, that is, Mary, the most excellent among creatures. For as by the ark those who were in it were saved from the deluge, so by Mary we escape the shipwreck of sin. The ark was made by Noah, which means rest. For the preservation of the human race, Mary, the spiritual ark, was prepared as an instrument of the world's redemption by Christ, who is our peace and our rest. In the ark, only eight souls were saved. Through Mary, all are called to eternal life. The ark was built in the space of a hundred years. Mary possessed the perfection of all virtues represented by the number 100, which is a number of fullness and perfection.
As the ark floated on the waters of the deluge, so Mary was preserved from the waves of sin and destruction. Unquote. Now to this I will add that just as it took 100 years for the building of Noah's ark, which gave generous time for the human race to repent, so it appears that in our time we also have been given 100 years to heed this ark, the Blessed Virgin Mary of Fatima. As I wrote in 2008, and again in my book, Fatima, The Signs and Secrets, which, by the way, is available on Amazon, are we who live today living on a 100-year time limit? After all, in the scriptures, there appears to be the precedent established, a precedent of a 100-year time frame in which the human race is given ample time to heed the prophet of God. But there is another precedent, which I will in a moment share. But first, I will say that in the case of the Virgin of Fatima, it's a matter of heeding the Queen of all prophets, the Virgin Mary. Now, in brief, at Fatima, she requested of us the daily rosary, reparation for sins, fidelity to our daily duty as Catholics and in our states in life, the wearing of the blessed brown scapular, and the five first Saturdays of reparation to her Immaculate Heart. But there is one thing more, a command which only a Pope and the world's Catholic bishops can fulfill. The Virgin Mary said that God wants them, as one body, to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. And when that occurs, a great grace of conversion will occur, and, as the Virgin also promised, an era of peace will be granted to the world. In fact, Our Lady had first said in 1917 to three shepherd children that she would one day come to ask for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart and for the repertory devotion of the Five First Saturdays. Specifically, Our Lady said, quote, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the First Saturdays. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted, and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and she will be converted and an era of peace will be granted to the world. Our Lady kept her promise and did indeed return on June 13, 1929, to say that, quote, the moment has come, unquote, wherein God asks, in reality, commands, the Holy Father to make this act in union with the bishops. In fact, her words were as follows. The moment has come when God asks the Holy Father to make, in union with all the bishops of the world, the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, promising to save it by this means. So numerous are the souls which the justice of God condemns for sins committed against me that I come to ask for reparation. Sacrifice yourself for this intention and pray. Now, despite all the objections to the contrary, there is abundant proof that to this day, heaven's command to the church's hierarchy has not been explicitly obeyed. As if all other proofs do not suffice, all we need to do is pay attention to what's occurring both in the church and in the world today. There is nothing but growing resistance to the Lord God himself and a growing animosity toward our neighbors. Charity has indeed grown cold. Earlier, I mentioned that there is another historical precedent that demonstrates that there are serious occasions in which the Lord God gives mankind a 100-year time limit to repent or to suffer dire consequences. We already know about the history of Noah's Ark and the Deluge, in which only eight souls were saved after God gave the world 100 years to heed him, to repent, 
and to enter Noah's Ark. As I have often rhetorically asked, first in a 2008 Fatima series that I wrote, and then again in my book, Fatima, The Signs and Secrets, and many times since, if in our time there is also a 100-year time limit, when does it end? In 2017, which has already passed, but it was the 100-year anniversary of the Fatima Virgin's apparitions. Or in 2029, the 100-year anniversary of the date on which the Virgin returned to say that the moment has come when God himself asks the Holy Father to obey. The 100-year president is also seen in the case of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, who often appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. Our Lord gave to this saint the devotion of the nine First Fridays of the Sacred Heart, but he also had a command for the Catholic monarch of France. One can see the similarities between the Sacred Heart apparitions and the later apparitions of the Lord's Virgin Mother in Fatima, Portugal. Our Lord told St. Margaret Mary to impart a message to the King of France, and it was that his Sacred Heart wished to reign in his palace, to be painted on his standard, to be engraved on his arms, and that it, the Sacred Heart, will make him triumphant over all the enemies of Holy Church, if the King obeyed Christ's command on these matters. However, as history relates, Either Louis the Fourteenth never received the letter, or he refused to reply. But the command still stands. On June seventeenth, sixteen eighty nine, our Lord also told the saint to tell the Catholic King Louis the Fourteenth that France must be solemnly consecrated to his sacred heart. This command too was ignored by the king and his heirs. As a result, France, called the first daughter of the Church, because it was the first country in which the Catholic faith was recognized as the nation's religion, succumbed to the enemies of the Church, just as the Sacred Heart had foretold. Exactly 100 years later, on June 17, 1789, the godless Third Estate declared itself a national assembly, lawlessly stripping the reigning Catholic monarch, who was then Louis XVI, of his authority. Thus, the reign of terror went into full motion. The king, his queen, and other innocents were martyred. Due to the ravenous Mademoiselle Guillotine and her devotees, the streets literally ran ankle-deep in blood, and apostasy reigned. To think of what France, and with it the Church, could have been spared if only one of the reigning kings had obeyed the simple command of our Lord. Christ our King wished to establish the public consecration and devotion to his Sacred Heart in order to save France, first daughter of the Church, and with it Christendom. As we now know, through the apparitions at Fatima, Portugal, the Sacred Heart also wills the collegial consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, this time to save the entire world from the punishments it deserves for its many sins. Our Lord also made it known to Sister Lucia of Fatima that he wishes to have the whole world acknowledge that Russia and the world will be saved by the collegial consecration, so that the Immaculate Heart of his mother will be honored beside his Sacred Heart. In briefly reviewing this tragic history of the French Revolution, especially the fates of the Catholic monarchs and thousands of innocents, we fully understand how the Lord's apparitions and requests at Père Le Magnon are linked to Our Lady's requests at Fatima. In fact, after Our Lady had returned to ask for the consecration, two years later, in August of 1931, Our Lord himself spoke to Sister Lucia, the sole surviving visionary of the Fatima apparitions. He referred to his command for the collegial consecration of Russia. As we now know, by the choice of God's own words, he left no doubt that the request of his mother was also his own command and will. When he said, 
make it known to my ministers that given they follow the example of the king of France in delaying the execution of my request, they will follow him into misfortune. It will never be too late to have recourse to Jesus and Mary. In regard to the long-awaited collegial consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart, is it not possible that our Lord was also telling us that, like the King of France, he will again allow exactly 100 years for his ministers to completely obey him? And that's the question as I asked it in 2008. If so, then the 100-year time limit, like that given as far back as the time of Noah and the building of the ark, expires on June 13, 2029. From the time of this recording, only about eight years hence. There is also the prophecy of Our Lady at Akita, Japan, which occurred in 1973. In this particular prophecy, she the perfect archetype of the Ark of Noah, again warns of what will occur if mankind does not a stop offending God. She even referred to the deluge, that is, the worldwide flood of Noah's time, which destroyed all of mankind except for the eight souls on the Ark. At Akita, the Virgin said, As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will never have seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms that will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the Pope, the bishops, and the priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. Pray very much the prayers of the rosary. I alone am able to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. To once more repeat the words of St. Bernard, who spoke of Noah's Ark, the sole place of refuge made by God for those who wished to be saved. In the Ark, only eight souls were saved. Through Mary, all are called to eternal life. The Ark was built in the space of a hundred years. Mary possessed the perfection of all virtues represented by the number 100, which is a number of fullness and perfection. And as Our Lady herself said at Fatima, Are you suffering a great deal? I will never abandon you. My Immaculate Heart will be your refuge and the path that leads you to God. And so today we remember that Noah's Ark is a figure type for the Virgin Mary, a figure type of refuge for our souls and for our salvation. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you'd like to help other listeners find us, please like this broadcast and also subscribe to this channel, Genesis 315. Until the next time, may God bless you and may Our Lady Mary keep you and yours under her starry mantle. Salve Regina.